prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for the day that you've given to us and the ability to gather together, hear your word, and uh, have our, our faith strengthened so that we can live as people of hope in this dark world. Uh, give us a confidence through your word this morning uh, that uh, we would uh, continue to grow uh, in our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we jump into 1 Peter, and we'll be in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, uh, pages 16 and 17 in the handout. Before we jump in there, any questions or comments about this morning's service? While well, it's somewhat fresh in mind, it's been almost half an hour, so it, you might have forgotten everything already. But if anything's still fresh in mind that you wanted to ask about or comment on, um, feel free. <laughs> It was good to be reminded that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. That was the first direction I was going to go with uh, preaching uh, and ended up going a different direction as studying the texts and um, thinking about this father a little bit more. Um, but, you know, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Uh, so the, the people that you see around you are not really, they seem like the, the enemy usually, but they're not really the enemy. Um, the devil is the enemy. Uh, the the spiritual the struggles that we have these these are the the real problems and um, one of the one of the initial directions I was thinking about preaching was that and then uh, to talk about my mom you know doing devotion with you know. Uh, but I don't know how I'm going to get through that sermon. Um, so we'll we'll try a different direction. Um, but, you know, to put on the full armor of God, well, what does that look like on a daily basis? Why don't you open up the story, story Bible with your kids? I was thinking that would be a good Halloween costume, but <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, that one, yeah, yeah, not a bad one. Is there any part, Pastor, you know, about what the man first said, and then, like you said, what Jesus said in return, it's kind of like, wow, yes. He you know, dismissed all you guys, him. All you people want to, you know. But then the guy replied again, was there any part of the first part of what Jesus said to kind of test him a little bit? And then, you know, he didn't just, you know, kind of drop his head and turn away and why he, you know, replied again to Jesus. And he, okay, you're so lit. Was there any part of that? I don't know. Yeah, so there, there's a number of times when Jesus is, seems pretty cold and hard. Right. Uh, and there are times when he says things and people just turn away and walk away. You know, let 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 the let the dead bury their own dead. You know, the, the son of man has no place to to rest his head. You know, foxes have homes, birds have homes, but not the son of man. Um, and there are people who say, you know, I want to follow you. He talks like that, and uh, mm -hmm. then there's the the woman whose right. daughter was uh, possessed by a demon. And he doesn't even like address her at first, and then he implies that she's a dog. That's right. Uh, she goes back to the crumb. But yeah, she and she she holds on to that. So with that, there's a little bit more that Jesus is offering her by calling her a dog and using the word not the mangy mutt that's in the alley, but the dog that sits at your lap and is under your table and is going to get fed. There, Jesus is clearly like, "Here's your opening." Here you go. Um, but with this man, it, that's a little less clear than the, what, as he says, you people, unless you people see signs and wonders, you'll never believe. Um, but it seemed like he wasn't discouraged by that statement. Yeah. And and there's there's some things that, so this man comes from Capernaum and he goes to Cana. Does that mean Roman was a royal official or not necessarily? It seems that it was probably connected to to that. So probably a Gentile. Um but that, that's a little unclear. I mean you have uh, Gentile tax collectors, but you got Matthew, right. a Jewish tax collector. And so there's not enough that we know. The the so coming from Capernaum to Cana, Cana is John says in the reading we had this morning, where he first, where he turned water into wine, the first of the miraculous signs. And this is the second of the miraculous signs. And, but Capernaum, uh, it's interesting that he comes from there. So Jesus is born where? 
Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Uh, he moves from Bethlehem for a short stay in, to live in Egypt. Egypt. Uh, then he is raised in yeah. Nazareth, uh, Galilee and Nazareth. Um, so th there, all of those could be called his home. But as a 30-year-old man, Capernaum is his home. Like That's his base of operations. That's his hometown. So this man that comes from Capernaum clearly knows something of Jesus. What does he know of him? He knows to go to Cana, uh, that he's there, and he's probably heard about what happened in Cana by this point, um, th this miracle, which is a, a superfluous miracle in a way. You don't need wine to live. Like, you don't need to have a, a big, successful, well-run wedding celebration. It's not necessary for life. You know, even a marriage, though a marriage is like the, you know, paradise echoing out. It's an echo of paradise here in the valley of the shadow of death. Marriage can be remarkable, but it doesn't pay the bills. It doesn't guarantee that you're going to make your way up in your career goals. It's the marriage is not going to keep you out of the hospital. So wine at a wedding in one way is entirely superfluous. It's not needed. It's not necessary. But it's the first of his signs. And it's a defining kind of sign. And if this man who has a dying son knows of Jesus, that he's willing to give us the superfluous stuff that is really actually more important. Um, and the, the wine and the joy of a, a wedding a celebration and a marriage, all of these things uh, point to the fact that we are not just mere animals trying to survive. You know, we're made for more. And so that he has this first miracle that is so superfluous, wine at a wedding, uh, it shows the dignity that he um, has given to mankind. We're not the animals that are just surviving. We're not survival of the fittest. We're made for joy, which is superb. We're made for a wedding celebrations, parties that don't pay the bills, but cost a lot of money. Um, <laughs> we're made for, for the joy of marriage uh, and all of the struggles uh, in marriage. Uh, we're made for more than just... Um, survival and having children that's the animals do that and that's wonderful for the end but we're beyond that so if this man from capernaum he's got a dying son and he sees jesus and he knows of jesus that he he loves these superfluous things which actually show the dignity that we have as humans like they're in a way more important than the practical things of paying the bills or you know fixing broken arm if he cares that much, he's going to care about my son. He's going to do something. So he comes to Cana, uh, and Jesus, unless, unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, you're, you're never going to believe. It. But he knows of, he's got to know of this first sign. I think, I think we're not reading too much into the text to say that this is what he knows of Jesus, the wine maker at a wedding. And so he's the one that is willing to do miraculous signs and wonders, <clears throat> capable of, willing to do it, and he does it with wine at a wedding. And maybe maybe he's already heard some of the information about the, the, the miracle. That his mother came to him, said they have no more wine, and Jesus is kind of similarly cold. Harsh woman, not mom, not dear mother, woman, you people, woman, what is what is it between me and you? We, we have a hard time translating that for what he's trying to say there, but what's going on between us? What is this? And he still does it. So there's there's a parallel here with the first and the second miracle. Um, there's a request. They have no more wine at least implied request. And there's this harsh, cold woman, what is it? Same thing. He begs for his son's life. Oh, you people. 
with the wine, he still does it. And maybe that's what he's holding on to. Maybe he knows enough of what happened at Cana. And John wants us to remember that and recall what happened at Cana. And so I think, I don't think we're stretching it too much. Maybe he knows, but this is kind of how he talked to his mom and he still did something. And how he's kind of harsh with me, you people. I think he's probably going to still do something. I'm not 100% on that, which is, that's one of the directions I was going. And then since I wasn't 100%, well, maybe I won't go that direction. But there's something, there's something to the connection, the parallel between the first miracle and the second miracle. The request, a harsh response from Jesus, and he still does something. He still changes the water into wine. He still heals the son. And maybe that's what the this royal official is holding on to. That light bulb that came on would have been amazing right on the story. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't Seventh it? hour. I mean, he, you know, he's like, man, that's right. When Jesus. Seventh hour, which is really interesting. They, I mean, they don't have watches. They talk about time differently. They would usually use a more general term. Uh, if it's just something that happened whenever, uh, third hour, sixth hour, ninth hour are general sorts of terms usually uh, that, uh, you know, it's it's morning, it's noon. Um, they're talking about that. They would usually tell time, but the way we would say like mid-morning, but we're so used to it. It, was, it happened at 10.07. <laughs> so when it's when it's a an hour like this, the seventh hour, that's more specific it, because they usually, they probably would have said, well, it's about the sixth hour, oh, but they, they go a little more specific there. And he know he remembers, oh, this wasn't just noon. This is just, a, it was about an hour afternoon. You know, this is seventh hour. And so it clicks and boom. And now uh, it, there's the clarity that he gets from uh, Jesus said, your son lives at about the seventh hour. And that's when the fever left him. The other really cool thing in this text that the I, it was going to be like a 40-minute sermon. This is why I didn't go this direction. Was what the man is called throughout the text. At the beginning of the reading, he's called the royal official. A little later, he's only called the man. Our translation there when he's talking to Jesus uses the word royal official again, but not the original text, it's just the man. So it transitions from the royal official at the beginning, uh, that as he starts the first stage of the journey, when he's in this interaction with Jesus, he's stripped of his royal um, title. He's just the man. What was he called at the end when he gets to go back to his son? The father. <laughs> this is a neat, neat thing that happens there. Here, here is this someone who is important. And he goes in front of Jesus, uh, unless you people. Now he's like not, he's just a man. But with this word of life and this promise, uh, now, he, now he's what he would want to be remembered as, you know, as at his funeral, right? Uh, like, who cares about my royal official title? Father. And the struggle with Jesus, the struggle with life and death, and then coming to Jesus and having his words of rebuke and difficult to handle words of life and promise, you know, what does he even mean? Your son lives. Through that struggle, that's how he makes us who we're, we're to be. Through the suffering. So suffering produces patient endurance, character, hope. This man was made what he was made to be, father, um, throughout this whole difficult journey that he's going uh, through. Uh, is it really, I, I don't know if that's reading too much into the change from title, royal official, man, and then father. But it's kind of a unique thing that there's three different ways that he's referred to in a text. Uh, whereas usually it's the Pharisees, the Pharisees, the Pharisees, or just they. But they I think there's something to this that 
some royal official at the beginning, just a man. And then at the end, he gets to be father and run home to his son who's alive. Um, this is a fun text. <laughs> the, the neat thing that uh, we got to hear this morning. So go home and read it again uh, with some of those things in mind that we, we just wrestled with and talked about. Uh, the final, yeah. Oh, oh you're still no, on. Go ahead. Hmm. I was thinking about what Jerry said in Ephesians, mm -hmm. the same thing. Yeah. But I did question at the end of that the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms that I didn't quite evolve to be evil to heaven or in the heavenly realms. Yeah, isn't yeah. everything good in heaven? Yeah. Yeah, just, yeah that so that that does deserve some some attention. Uh what what does that mean? So when he is talking there. I'm going to find this here and just read it. Um, where should we start? So in verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The part of the debate is, does that include human beings and the devil and demons or just the devil and demons? Um, and I, I, I would say both. So there are, I mean, there are rulers and authorities in this world that are elected or that, um, you know, rise to power and become emperor or whatever that would be included, I, I think. Um, but uh, I'm not going to, it's clearly talking about the devil is involved here. There's spiritual stuff going on. But so there's a debate you know, when it goes to the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. Does that imply that the terms before that are talking about human beings uh, who are against Christ? Um, there's a little bit of wiggle room there. There's a little bit of debate. Um, but when you get to spiritual forces in the heavenly realms, what's happening there? We use the word heaven far differently than um, people at that time. I, there's the earth I'm standing on. There's this, which is the first heavens, which usually would include like from here up into the clouds. And then there's like a second heaven above there that, depending on who is talking, if it's a Greek philosopher or if it's coming from a, a Hebrew source at that time, um, there's differences there. Paul talks about someone that he knew that was raised up into the seventh heaven. I think that, that was the number. Um, for the ancient world, the our little blue globe is the earth. And then there are the heavens where the birds are, the heavens where the clouds are. There's, you know, where you have the sun and, and the planets of our solar system. And so it the heavens are everything above dirt. Um, so the forces of spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Is that this, maybe, or is it like the first chapter of Job, where there in the throne room of heaven, there's this evil one that gets called before, and they have this conversation, and God says, well, what about my man Job? Uh, and the devil, wow, well, he's rich. Of course he likes it. Things help him. We got kids. Of course he likes it. Take him away. Stubborn, stubborn evil <laughs> one that's there, we could say, in the heavenly realms. Um, um, I don't know. <laughs> I, it, it's, yeah, I don't. because we, we think heaven and we just think through the gates and everything's just there. That's where the souls of the faithful are with God. Uh, that's the way we normally use it. 
they use it a little bit differently. Um, it's a broader uh, term when talking about heaven. Um, so the birds of the heavens uh, might be one translation to talk about, you know, because they're right up here in the heavens, uh, the, the stuff up there. Um, I think I go to the first chapter of Job. The spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We have the devil. We have Satan uh, coming before God in the throne room of God. Um, and he, or like what he does with Peter, asking to sift Peter as wheat. Um, that there's there's this thing that we kind of don't know a whole lot of detail about. That God and the devil and the demons have conversations about stuff from time to time. So are you saying that the enemy has like, like an like, like an at minimum some sort of temporary access to to heaven when necessary? Uh, when I would say when when he's called upon, like he doesn't get, just get to go there. But if God says come here, he has no choice but to come. But he's not uh, necessarily. Uh, like locked away in hell. So there, in the in the book of Revelation, which is visionary language, uh, it talks about when he will be, you know, tossed away for forever. Now he's viewed in the New Testament as like a a famished lion who's chained up and can only go so far. And in the book of Job, it seems that if God says, come here, um, come before me, present yourself before me, because all of the angels and the devil and the demons are fallen angels, they're under his command. And if he says come, they got to come. Um, but they had the freedom to uh, rebel against him. And, and now, you know, they're, if, if he says, come here, I need to talk to you. He's got to go. So he doesn't have free, a he never has free access to heaven. He's not allowed to do anything. Um, you know, he can't attack the souls uh, who are there. And it doesn't seem, we have no uh, evidence in the scriptures to, to say that the souls who are in heaven would notice Satan. You know, like when he's talking with God about Job. Um, but if, if God's going to talk to him, he's going to, the devil's got to, show up he was chained um in that way it seems that after at the last day when the lord jesus returns and there's the resurrection then he's finally shut up in the abyss which is only pictured to us in um illustrative ways and i don't want to know about from experience you know what that is where that is, things like that i don't know i just don't want to be there do you think the uh, the term the the the, uh, the spiritual forces in heaven? Uh, I don't remember the exact heavenly realms. Heavenly realms. Yeah. Do you think that kind of implies that the abyss is one of the heavenly realms? That's a po that's one of the possibilities that people go to. That you know, not using the word heaven the way we normally think about it, just paradise with God. But a little bit more in this sense of it's not earth, it's elsewhere, which was kind of the way that that the heavens was used. Um, this is a little crude to just say, well, where the birds are, the clouds are, the solar system is. For them in their mind, it was also like anything that where we would say, you know, what's one of the terms that we use now, like a, a whole other plane of existence, you know, beyond the universe, another dimension. We, we use the word dimension. So you've uh, got the multiverse uh, and, you know, uh, comic book stuff. Um, so in a whole other place, they're using this word heavens, heavenly realms as, well, we don't know how quite how to talk about it, but it's not earth. It's not where we're, where we are. Um, like, where is God? Where is heaven? It's not in the clouds. You know, it's not somewhere, you know, we can pinpoint in the uh, galaxy or something like that. 
God's beyond time uh, and he's beyond space and matter. And so, well, where, what's that then? Same thing would be with what we call hell. It's not under, it's not the core of the earth. Although from our experience, if we're going to talk about hell, well, lava and, you know, <laughs> you know, underneath and darkness and all of that, that seems to be like the best picture for us. But it's not within this realm of existence, this dimension, the way we might talk about it, that the heavenly realms is, it's beyond the created universe. That help. Yeah. There's a lot about that we don't know. Um, what we want to know is in Christ and through faith in Christ, you're not going to have any experience of what hell is like or where it is or anything like that. You'll be with God and be safe. Um, those are the things that are crystal clear in scripture. But then how do, how do you even talk about something beyond the created world, the created universe? And the ancients would talk about the heavens in this way, and then also in the whole other dimension sort of way. Okay. Anything else? There was something, I think. Or it was a hand that had gone up at some point while I was babbling, or a thought that came to my mind that I'm not going to remember. Um, okay, well, that's probably a good breaking point. We, we made up a lot of ground in First Peter today, <laughs> uh, but good, good said that I, I love doing this. You know, opening up for things that are are uh, fresh in mind from the church service. Um, but we did start a little early, so we'll end a little early. Uh, taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory, forever and ever. Grab a stack of bags, uh, drop them off, whether it's today or uh, later in the week. Uh, again, no need to knock on anyone's door. Uh, just set it on the, uh, maybe even under the mat a little bit. And away we go. We'd love to see them all gone. <laughs> <laughs>